The time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Pantula Podcast, brought to you by the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, for those of you guys who never heard of the AAPRP or came across us before, um, our objective is Pan Africanism. And if you're not familiar with Pan Africanism, or if you had some distortions on what you think Pan Africanism might be, we define it as a total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. Uh, this definition was defined by the Fifth Pan African uh, Congress that was headed by the likes of um, Nkrumah, George Padmore, um, Amy, uh, Amy Garvey, and others. Um, so today, uh, uh, on this episode, we're going to talk about ideology. Um, you know, the importance of it. Uh, you know, how to apply it, and etc. Um, but before we get started, uh, each episode we'd like to dedicate to two of our ancestors. Um, so I'm here with my comrade Winford, and he's going to go ahead and uh, let you guys know who we, who we dedicate this episode to. Uh, so we're dedicating this episode to two ancestors from Nigeria. Uh, the first is Margaret Ekpo. Uh, Margaret Ekpo was born on July 27, 1914. Uh, and in the 40s, she organized alongside women in Aba, Abia State, to form a market women's association a union that fought for the economic and political rights of women in Nigeria. Later on, she joined the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, or the NCNC, to fight for for decolonization and protested alongside uh, Bunmilayo Ranto Mikuti and several others against the colonial practices of the British in Nigeria. what one uh, famous protest is like those made at the Enugu coal mine. Uh, she fought for women who were abused by men in the country and pushed for the political involvement of women into politics. Uh, she also helped create the NCNC's women's wing alongside Flora and Namdi Azikwe. After Nigeria gained independence, she actually won a seat in the Eastern Regional House of Assembly and use her position to fight for the improvement of infrastructure and of the economic and political rights of women in Nigeria. Um, next, we have Inandi Azikwe. Uh, my apologies if I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, Inandi Azikwe was born November 16, 1904. Uh, known as the father of Nigerian nationalism, he was one of the driving forces be- behind the push for Nigeria's independence. Uh, as a founding editor, edit, editor of the African Morning Post and several other African-led newspapers, it's said to be 12 uh, daily African-led newspapers. He wrote on African nationalism, Black pride, and against colonialism. He later became active in the Nigerian youth movement, and organ- the, the country's first nationalist organization, and later co-founded the NCNC. Uh, organizing Africans towards independence and supporting strikes and boycotts against the colonial government. In response to these efforts and to the efforts of several others, uh, Nigeria gains its independence and he served as the, as the first president of Nigeria. All right. Thanks, my friend. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, first question being, you know, I'll just try to give a quick uh, definition on what ideology is. So, um, ideology is a set of ideas and thoughts that guide actions, right? Um, so essentially, you have varying ideologies. You have people who believe in Marxism. You have people who believe in um, anarchism and people who believe in, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think what else is out there, like capitalism or uh, just bourgeois ideology, like uh, liberalism or whatever, right? Um, so all those ideas inform how you move about a day to day and how how you form an analysis and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, so that's essentially those thoughts lead to actions, right? Um, so a question I guess I will pose for, uh, for the sake of the podcast is, why do we deem ideology important? 
so I'd say that uh, I see ideology as the thought processes behind how we understand what the world is uh, and how we should uh, navigate in that world. Uh, ideology is important because it serves as really a foundation for how we approach things in society. Or so like, let's say like, uh, you can have an ideology or understanding uh, that the world is something that uh, can be changed uh, and can be improved upon. Uh, if you have that ideology that serves as a foundational basis and saying that, okay, like given this assumption that the world can be improved, uh, I'm going to make the effort uh, to improve these things. Uh, you can have really an ideology about anything. Because uh, it's, as Sadiq mentioned, just like really thoughts and understandings of the world. Um, and so having an ideology allows you to really be consistent in the things that you're doing. Uh, like your ideologies can always uh, be challenged. And uh, with that challenging, uh, you can engage in conversation, dialectics to improve your understanding of the world, uh, given proof and evidence. Uh, but it allows you to be consistent and have a metric by which you stand by so that you can be efficient at the things you want to accomplish. Yeah, definitely. And then just looking at it from the confines of an organization, ideology is very important, especially when you talk about your objective, because those thoughts and actions will lead to action, which then leads you to your objective. So without ideology, you know, you could get confusion because if you just have an organization um, and don't really try to adhere to an ideology, what could happen? I'm not saying it's going to, but you leave uh, the ability for this to happen in the sense that where people join your organization and they have they believe in liberalism, but you have a revolutionary objective. So then, you know, that idea or that notion of, you know, liberalism or uh you know, um, any other bourgeois ideology may permeate throughout your organization, which could then hijack, uh, you know, some of your goals or objectives for the party. And then you're going to consistently have struggles. There's going to be a lot of ideological confusion. It's going to be like, wait, this is our goal, but we're trying to do some type of reform, but we're not looking to eventually, you know, meet our, you know, so this is going to be a whole bunch of noise, right? And this will be no clarity, um, but even then, with that understanding is that even if you do have ideology in the party, it doesn't mean that you don't have to engage and struggle with, with party members. Because once again, people come in with, you know, other ideologies, uh, you know, and then obviously, you know, it was a living under capitalism. They embed the ideology of capitalism. Right. Um, you know, there's like a big umbrella of that that encompasses that ideology. Um, once again, neoliberalism, neoconservatism, uh, individualism. Uh, so forth and so on, right? Uh, so we come into, you may come into a revolutionary party thinking that. So this is why ideology, ideology is important is because everyone can have a consistent understanding of, uh, you know, in, in, in relation to thoughts and ideas to help lead to that uh, objective, essentially. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, because people take that as like, oh, so I can't be an individual. I have to think like everyone else. No, you just have an analysis on how the world works, right? Or how the world uh, navigates and you're, you're in cohesion with other comrades. Um, but with that, you know, there's certain various aspects that you guys may struggle on. So, so some, some party member may be newer, some party, may be, some party member may be stuck in some old way of thinking um, that you may have to struggle against. So just because, you know, even within our party, we practice Nkrumahism to raise So following the ideas and thoughts of Kwame Nkrumah and Secretary Ray, um, essentially. And, uh, you know, we still have to struggle. <laughs> there's, there's still a struggle that goes on in our party where, you know, we have to, and we all are under the same umbrella. Um, granted, we have different degrees of experience within an organization and um, political education or ideological training. But, you know, uh, that's why it's important. So it helps us reach reach that reach our objectives uh, essentially. So uh, yeah, so I guess I, one of the other things I think we should probably get into is uh, making the, the 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 distinction between ideology versus method versus objective. So I think uh, those three sometimes get conflated, 
when we have these discussions or like ideology, like the purpose of it. Um, so I want to get like your take on that one for two, like, uh, like what, what, how do you distinguish between ideology versus method versus objective? Like what are the differences between the three and how do we make sure we're able to distinguish those three? Um, yeah, and don't like lump them in in conversation. So I think the way that I, under I understand it, ideology would be the way how the world uh, works and functions. Uh, objectives would be the goal or like vision you want to see in that world. And then method would be the way that you achieve the objective given the ideology. Uh, so like, let's say, like, just give like a simple example. Like, let's say I uh, want to go to like a conference. Uh, let me, yeah, let, let's keep with that. Let's say I want, let, well, actually let's do something like uh, bigger. Like, let's say we want to like work towards African independence and self-sufficiency. Uh, that would be an, an that would be our objective as an organization. Uh, our ideology would be uh, the way that we understand the world, uh, the way that we understand how like uh, economies and people work together. Um, and like for example, one aspect of our ideology is that we believe that all people are like human and all people should be treated uh, well. Uh, with that assumption, we can say that like oppression and oppression is bad anywhere. And so we can say that oppression in Africa is bad. Exploitation is bad. Uh, exploitation isn't something that's uh, normal or to be expected in society. Uh, and so we can say that like our ideology pushes towards, pushes against oppression of African people. Um, and so with the objective of African, and sometimes like ideology and objectives can feed into each other and like enrich each other in different ways. Um, but the idea is that both of those ideology and objective align with each other. Um, once we have the like ideology and objectives, uh, we have the method. So like the ways that we would like achieve our objective of African liberation. Uh, method would be like, let, would, we're, would really be organized. So like working alongside other people across the world uh, to make a, to push towards a society that we want to see. So yeah. just to be short, ideology is uh, how does the world work? Uh, objective is what do we want to see in the world? Um, and then method is how do we get from uh, how the world, how do we get to our objective using our ideology? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, yeah, ideology is once again, uh, the thoughts that guides the action method. It's, you know, how you're going to like what, what, in which way you're going to use to achieve that objective. Um, so essentially like, uh, you know, we talk about the various independence movements that happen um, across the world, but in this case, we kind of regulated to Africa. You had some um, who utilized, uh, you know, nonviolence. Some of you had to use guerrilla warfare um, as a method, right? Um, so, you know, it's this understanding as like Nkrumah Suarez, we understand that you could change like tactics and methods, but you can't change principles, um, right? So like the underlying principle being that we want to have a just society right like that's the principle you can't you know you want to want a just society you want an unjust society it's really no in between with that but versus mm -hmm. your method you know you can switch like one day you could be like oh okay i think we should try to use nonviolence, right and then if you try to use nonviolence, you see it doesn't work um then you can switch the tactic to guerrilla warfare um and i think we've seen that with the pipc and getting the style and them switching on how they did their methods um essentially like they tried to uh, mobilize the city, um, city members, and then they, they had to escape from that and use a different method and engage in guerrilla warfare. Um, you know, so uh, that, that kind of is like an example on how you could switch your method, um, essentially, uh, if need be, to adopt to the situation. And then like you said, like, uh, objectives is, a, is what you do it for is an overall, overarching thing, right? Like, 
this is the society we want to see and realize in, in this world today, um, which, you know, maybe for us in the AVRP is a United Socialist Africa. Um, so that's our objective, essentially, is uh, trying to see that reality. So that ideology um, then is the base, which, you know, uh, informs the method, and that method will lead us to our objectives, essentially. Um, so, and also, too, you could also look at methods like, you know, we, we practice dialectical and historical materialism. So that's a method we use to inform our analysis on anything. Um, right. So, like, we, we use those tools. So, we, you know, method could be, like, once again, how, how to inform your analysis or how to, uh, how to engage in, in confrontation with the enemy or how to, you know, just different aspects of things you want to engage in. Um, you know, I think that's, that's also another way to look at methods. So, uh, so yeah, so I guess with that being said, I guess, how do we like further our understanding of ideology? Um, right. Like, um, like it's kind of like what approach should we take into doing that? Um, yeah. essentially, uh, so say one more point about, uh, ideology method objectives and yeah. then, uh, I can speak on that. Like, I, I think know. one thing that's been mentioned already is that methods can change, uh, mm -hmm. but the um, the method itself has to be, like, analyzed and checked uh, to see if it's in line with both the ideology and objectives. Uh, so, like, I can give one example. If the objective is a, a united uh, and liberated Africa, uh, you can't have a method of colonizing another country in Africa or like working with imperialists uh, to steal resources from other countries in Africa because that doesn't uh, achieve the objective. Uh, that can like just, really, it can only, it doesn't, it can like achieve an objective, but just not the one that you want to. Uh, so, like, the purpose of ideology and objectives is to have uh, really an understanding behind, to, an understanding behind and, like, uh, a good knowledge of the effectiveness of your method. Uh, that's actually why uh, there is, like, Thomas Sankara, he actually uh, said something similar to this about uh, how he needs all of the people in his military to be educated. Uh, because with that political education, uh, the military is able to understand why they're fighting. Uh, if they had no political education or understanding of uh, their ideology or objectives, uh, for one, they could end up using any method uh, that they wanted, which could end up being contradicted, contradictory towards like what they want to see. Uh, and then for another, like if they're just like soldiers, uh, without any knowledge of what they're doing, uh, they can end up, uh, yeah, they can end up doing things for the wrong cause or for the wrong objective. Yeah, like, you can see people uh, like killing other members or like, you know, trying to steal from people, uh, you know, with their arms. So I think yeah, he said something across the lines of like, uh, you know, uh, what is it, a militant without like political education is a potential like criminal, essentially. Um, because if you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it, if you don't have that basis, that ideology to inform your action, you you know, you may just start working for your personal interests. Um, but you know, the further you understand, uh, have an understanding of the ideology, you have that ideological training, which is political education, which is uh, what I was alluding to in the question, like, you know, how do we, further understand the ideology, like what helps us understand it is that political education process, um, right? Like, because without that political education, once again, you, you start, you know, deviating from some of the, uh, some of the methods or practices that can help you guys lead to the objectives. Um, you may start engaging in reactionary things that you may think that's helpful for the party because, you know, you, you're, you're kind of doing this on an individualist an individualistic stance just trying to think like oh okay like the way i think is right you know i think you know there's nothing wrong with the way i think and that's what everyone thinks there's nothing wrong with what i think <laughs> <laughs> everything is fine like you know um you know and then you could be right you could be wrong but 
um, mm-hmm. you won't really know until you engage in that political education process uh, a lot of times, right? Um, it's further that understanding, okay, like uh, that these set of ideas help form this action, whatever. So, um, and I think we, you know, we've seen uh, certain organizations deviate, uh, you know, turn to like from revolutionary organizations to more so reformist or reactionary organizations because that political education wasn't as strong. They may have had it, but it wasn't prevalent in the organization. And I think sometimes we even downplay the role of political education. It's, oh, you guys just want to read books. It's like you guys just want to sit down and just talk. And th- but people don't understand the work that it even takes to sit down with a group of 10 people, six, eight, 15, whatever the number is, and struggle on ideas, struggle because everyone is coming from different aspects of the society, right? Um, you know, they may not, some people have an understanding on this. Some people don't have understanding on this. Some people may think this way, but we all have to have and come and further that ideological uh, understanding. Um, and the only way we do that is with struggle. And uh, it's not just like, oh, okay, we read this book, no one says anything, and we just go to the next book. We get to this book, we have to break down the ideas. What is this person saying? How is this, how is this um, guiding our, act? Or how does this help us in guiding our actions to our objectives? Is this applicable? Is this not, well, well, you know, just just really breaking it down, like breaking it down. And um, as much as maybe I, I make it sound simple, when you actually do it, it is like a process. It is like, in some cases, strenuous sometimes. Like you're, you're on a call for two, three, four hours, whatever, just literally, you know, um, trying to tackle ideas and struggling on ideas to understand concepts and um, figure them out. But this is important, right? Because the same way we go to school and we struggle with uh, when we first come, you know, first, second grade, whatever the case is, we all don't know, or we aren't really good at math. Like, you know, we don't all don't come in knowing what's two plus two or what's four plus four. But, you know, through constantly struggling and understanding and, um, you know, studying, you get to understand these things and those things become easy for you, um, essentially. Just like, it's like with anything else in life. Uh, like you don't, you won't progress if you don't struggle, uh, essentially uh, to understand certain things. So, um, I think when you kind of break it down and you look at it from that perspective, I think it kind of simplifies it in a way to kind of show you that, all right, like if, if I actually like sit down and engage in the struggle with other party members and the org, cause like, that's the thing too, it has to be done in a collective manner. Yes, it's okay for people to do, I do a lot outside of reading, outside of work, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Just to, you know, um, get understanding on other elements. But um, but it's all correlated to stuff I, I read. It's all correlated to stuff like we do in a party and the work, whatever. But, um, but you won't really, because like, let's say like, you know, I was doing a lot of the studying on my own. I may not reach the same conclusion as if I was in an organization because my party members may have read it from a different perspective. Like, and that's, a, that's another part of it, the importance of political education and doing it in a collectivist mode versus like individual, individualistic mode is that when you go ahead and read it yourself, you may interpret it one way, another person may interpret it another way, and then y'all could struggle on that. Okay, so why did you interpret it this way? And you start finding, you know, okay, so like, this is what I took from it. Why did you take this from it? You start trying to find the, the deeper understanding and meaning to what to what is being said. And then also, once again, it's, it's, it's uh, furthering your ideological training in that sense and your political education um, in that way. When it's by yourself, it's like, you know, well, yeah, maybe you, you could say you can do that, but when it's yourself. So it's like, you're going to probably think once again, oh, okay, the way I'm interpreting it is probably correct um, versus someone else. So, uh, so yeah, and it's not only sometimes just one person, it could be three or four other people on the call and they all three or four people but I all have different perspectives and then eventually y'all come to a common understanding. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is what this, what this text really meant in this way. Um, you know, after they constant struggle on that certain topic or on that certain passage or something like that. So yeah. I know I said a lot there, but <laughs> <laughs> like even for, uh, cause like with, uh, fighting for African liberation, like mm-hmm. we will be fighting against like very established and very organized like structures and institutions. And mm-hmm. the only way to do that is to have like a way of strategy. Uh, so like we might need like multiple methods or like multiple or do multiple things to achieve that goal. 
but like with strategy, like some things need to be timed. Some, some things need to be understood very like uh, precisely. Uh, and so if there is a common understanding uh, of like what we're doing and the purpose of everything uh, that we're doing is, uh, then we can like uh, be precise about like what things we do, what things we organize at what times, uh, like when we do them, how we do them, et cetera, et cetera. And with that strategy, uh, we can have that strategic and a, a strategic uh, and efficient approach at mm -hmm. uh, achieving our goals. Yeah, and then I think uh, some you said too is uh, it's very important to understand is that um, not only do organizations like revolutionary organizations are doing ideological training, and and it's funny because the, the whole purpose of this ideological training and not yeah is to get a further understanding but is in some ways to decolonize, you know, our minds because, you know, the, the state is putting you under ideological training, whether you know it or not. Um, and they do it in various ways. So these institutions that we grow up under, the educational uh, system institutions are embedding this into us, their bourgeois ideology since we're kids, right? Um, unless you grow up like in some revolutionary household where you're getting homeschooled and they're teaching to like revolutionary things so like that. Nine times out of 10, that's not happening. So like, you know, we are growing up, you know, doing stuff like a pledge allegiance to the flag where, you know, uh, star spangled banner. And they, so they embedding that whole like idea notion of American patriotism in you and like, you know, uh, you know, which is, which is advocating for genocide and uh, imperialism and, um, you know, colonialism and things of that nature, uh, because that's what this country is founded on. Uh, and that's what it exudes and practices on, on, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, year-to-year -year, uh, basis. So um, that's why it's important for us to have our own ideological training within these organizations uh, to combat that in a sense and to decolonize the way we think, um, because a lot of us are, well, all of us for the most part, um, you know, especially us as colonized subjects, uh, you know, are dealing with the fact that, you know, we're, we're being embedded with a uh, reactionary ideology, a bourgeois ideology. So we have to understand that and then have, have a process to de deconstruct that or, you know, decolonize that, decolonize that and have us, uh, and, you know, have us adopting ideologies that are not counterproductive to our interests, essentially. Um, so us fighting for free socialist Africa, united socialist Africa is to our interests, um, essentially because if Africa, which is our land, is liberated and free, it will be the most powerful <laughs> continent on the face of the earth. And then, you know, when you look at it from a political perspective, can intervene um, or come to our rescue and aid to Africans anywhere in the world, um, no matter where they can be. But right now, that's that can happen because, you know, Africa is organized. It's not socialist uh, at all. So, um, at least you know, throughout, predominantly, it's not socialist. <laughs> so, uh, and this is ran by reactionaries and uh, the petty bourgeois. So, so yeah, um, that's that's the whole purpose of it. So, um, I guess one thing maybe I could uh, pose too is, I guess, how would we go about, um, you know engaging in ideological training like uh like how do we go about setting that up like how would one do that well i guess the first uh thing you need is organization like you need to be alongside other people when uh doing political education uh whether it's like uh like a, whether it's like a, a video call or a phone call or like actually meeting people in person uh, you need people who can challenge you uh, and who can really make you question the things that you're doing and like why are you doing them. You need you know, like you like the foundation is having different perspectives uh, to have like conversation and dialectics with. Uh, once you have like those people or like uh, that organization, uh, really like uh, go through the perspectives and like histories of. Uh, people who have done uh, the work beforehand. I guess the first thing you need is an objective of like what you want to see. Uh, so like if your objective is like 
uh, just keep Africa the same. You don't really do need to do anything. Uh, you're already part of the organization that like <laughs> keeps Africa the same uh, by default of being of being like raised and like part of uh, the system that we're in today. Uh, but if your goal is African liberation, uh, like first, like finding people of different perspectives and like with that group of people working to like understand the history of Africa, understanding the history of like really everywhere in the world, uh, look at like uh, different strategies, uh, different like uh, attempts that people have made at uh, achieve at like working towards African liberation. Um, read like a bunch of books, try to listen to the elders uh, who are still alive, uh, like go on YouTube, watch like a bunch of videos uh, from people who have worked towards, who have, six, who have worked towards African freedom. Uh, do we have any like recommendations of books that we can give? Uh yeah, I mean, uh, I know we have a Jamu's book. Um, I'm drawing a blank here. I'll put it in the bio. Uh, dang, I can't think of the name, but that that's a good guide. I know he talks about um, like how to organize, how to set up like PE sessions and things of that nature. Um, so that's one book I'm, that's like on top of mind. Um, I could drop a whole bunch of references and you know below as like uh, reference points essentially um, for the viewers here. Um, I'm pretty sure I could probably refer to like uh, different revolutionary parties who done that, like uh, PIGC, PDG, so forth and so on, like the different texts that they read. So I could probably put that in their bio as well. So um, for people, but yeah, I think uh, setting up this PE sessions is has should be done in an organizational, you know, in an organization type of thing, right? Like um, with with a collective essentially, um, you know, not just you just going sitting in the room and corner reading yes that we you know we encourage that too because you no know, there may be some yeah there may be some text that your organization or your group may not handle but it's essential that you do it as a collective to struggle on ideas get a deeper understanding because that's the only way you would improve in your understanding on things um essentially uh you know not just like like once again doing it on your own um but yeah, so like within the AAPRP, you know, we have a basis of like uh, questions that we ask whenever we, we like read text and then we, you know, come together and then go one by one by each question, um, you know, and then we rotate that responsibility too on who, who handles that, that task. So, so yeah, I think that's, that's sort of basis, at least for those who are looking to maybe start their own organization um, or anything of that nature, you know, that's a good template to to have because i know since i've been in the party uh just that alone has, has done a lot um for me and it's like i've been able to take strides you know, with that uh you know since i've been here for like the past over a year so so um yeah man I, it's it's definitely imperative that you know we all engage in this in some in some manner in some form um which is for a good plug in to say join organization <laughs> like we say every episode uh yeah. you know to get that political education um and then once again you know if you're not in an organization maybe if you're watching this and you've been thinking about setting one up um you know i think that that could be a, a good basis for you right there you know just have a list of like 10 15 20 questions you know five questions whatever whatever you feel comfortable with uh from the text so like if you guys are reading three chapters you know, find 10 questions you can ask relative to those three chapters you guys are reading as a collective and then go one by one and, you know, start to tackle like, all right, so what do you guys think about this? And sometimes you may bear off, which it could be good too. Like you may mm -hmm. bear off some of those questions and ask other things. Like, hey, I came across this in a text. What did this mean? Or what did that mean? Whatever the case is. Because that's another thing too, is that when you read text by yourself, sometimes you could sometimes... It's, it could be a harder struggle than actually reading in the group because you may be reading the text and let's say it's like bigger words than you understand, whatever the case is. So if you're reading in a collective, let's say you understand what's kind of being said, you kind of get the basis, but there was some terminology and stuff being used. So you can literally work from ground zero. You can be like, oh, okay, I was reading the text. I don't understand like what is colonialism? What is imperialism? What is, 
the proletariat? What is, you know, you start asking these questions. What is dialectical materialism? What's historical materialism? You know, there's a lot of verbiage just being used, a lot of these books that may be more complex for some versus others. So you guys could break that down on the call. Not saying that you can't, you know, that this is why I'm saying that it, it could it could speed it up because the outer life training versus you did it yourself. Because if you're reading the text and every other word is something you don't understand and you're constantly just going to your phone, what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? You know, how long is it going to take you to finish that text, right? It's going to take you a while. And then you have to, because some, some terms aren't just easy, like, to understand just off the Google um, definition, because that definition may even be more complex. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but maybe you're like kind of struggling with it. You're like, okay, I kind of get what's being said. Like, you know, um, and then when you get to that meeting with the org or, you know, your folks, whatever, and you like, hey, I was reading this, but, you know, I know we have these questions, but I wanted to know what is X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z. And then um, your party members could then, you know, or your folks can then, you know, maybe if even if they don't know, maybe you guys can do it together. Let's Google this and okay, let's watch a short clip together. What does this mean? Or whatever the case is. Um, or let's circle back next week. That's going to be our homework to struggle with this topic or this definition because none of us know what it means, right? Um, so that's why that's why we say that uh, you know, this is an example why it's important to do this in a in an organized, collective manner versus just yourself. Because um, you can get further along, and it also improves uh, the militants that are in your party, um, and also the, the organization being stronger. Because if you have everyone aligned with the same goal and objectives and the same understanding, um, you know things, and you know it's going to be harder for uh, you know enemies of your organization or people who are looking to subvert your organization um, or the leadership in your organization. It's going to be harder for that to take place if everyone is aligned, and understands the objectives, um, you know, and the goals and, and everything like that. And just has that uh, ideological stance and backing to have or structured, you know, behind them. So, so yeah. Yeah, is there um, anything, anything uh, you'd like to add or uh, say as like last, last words or anything? Uh, I think like another point is like, well, I can give off. So I, uh, another point about like, uh, not trying to do ideological training like all on your own uh, mm -hmm. is that like sometimes there are references that and context that you wouldn't really understand uh, that like some people are just aware of uh, that you can't really Google or like uh, search online for very easily. Uh, so like for example, like some of these texts are like over a hundred years old, and so there are some words, some phrases. Uh, some like uh, context uh, that like wouldn't really be understood uh, nowadays uh, that would be understood like back then. So like, for example, if I'm reading something, if I'm reading like Du Bois and like he like wrote something from like the 1930s, uh, that's like almost like 90 years ago. Uh, so like you like you like not everybody will understand everything that's in it. Uh but there are people who were like uh around the who were who were like around not necessarily the, around the time that like Du Bois was there, but like still had the same like ideological understanding of it. Um so yeah, it, it's just a way to make it more efficient. Uh, like just understanding what the education is actually trying to show you. Yeah, and that, that's a good point. Like um, thinking about Du Bois because we just was reading uh, the World in Africa. This is my second time reading it in the org, but uh, you know he he says like a lot of like even when they talk about different empires, certain empires are like spelled different or say like if you think about mm -hmm. like when they even say like Ethiopia, they, they refer to it as Abyssinia, you know, um, which is an ancient name or they're talking about the Kush dynasty or they're talking about, um, you know, just various other, uh, you know, dynasties. You know, sometimes you don't have an understanding. Like if you don't know where this place is geographically, you could then raise that question in, in the org or if something is spelled differently, you know, back then versus how it is now. Um, you know, you could then question, hey, so what is this? You know, like I've seen this and then someone can distract, oh, this is what this is, whatever the case is, because someone may have uh more of an understanding of what that means so um so yeah uh yeah so we appreciate then, you guys yeah go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, go ahead and then like 
uh, I guess a couple of like reliable authors that like we uh, suggest is like definitely Kwame Nkrumah, uh, mm-hmm. Sekou Toure, uh, yeah. Kwame Toure, uh, otherwise known as Stokely Carmichael. Uh, mm-hmm. They're the they're like the founders of this organization, uh, and we use their ideology uh, as as the basis for the things that we do. Um, uh, I would recommend Michael Parenti. He has a good understanding and analysis of capitalism, uh, and particularly in the U.S. and Europe. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, I've been I've been reading uh, Events and Reality. That's a good book. I think that's actually the only Parenti book I have. Actually, I need to give him my. Parenti that's a bunch book. of speeches online on YouTube. Yeah, that's yeah, definitely. Book. Yeah, you guys could maybe I could put a link or two in the description or something too as well myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. We appreciate Bye. you guys. Oh wait, sorry. Oh, and then I guess. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, I guess the good, last thing good. that I want to say that is like uh, when like when like uh, trying to organize something, particularly like masses of people, particularly like trying to organize like all of Africa and like all Africans together, it's like. As the people say, it's like chess, not checkers. Uh, but you can't really do either chess or checkers if you don't know the rules of the game. And that's what ideology begins. Bars. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bar right there. Damn. Oh, boy, so you got to be prepared when you kind of play chess. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but that was definitely off the door. <laughs> yeah, that was hard. I like that. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, so we uh we definitely thank y'all for joining, uh, listening to another episode of the Pantula podcast. Um, we definitely implore you guys to listen to our other podcast. Um, I, it's funny because I always mess up on these, but I'm actually prepared this time to <laughs> reference our other podcast. So we also have the Ford Ever podcast on Spotify. Um, we also have our New Mexico chapter who does, I think, theirs every Thursday. Um, we also have the Revolutionary African Women um, podcast as well. We also have our ancestors' voices, which is done by uh, our comrade who's been in the party for about 40 plus years, Ajamu, and his lovely daughter. Um, so, yeah, uh, we definitely implore you guys to listen to their uh, podcast as well. You know, same, if not better, content than what we're providing here. We have the links in the description. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, just like we were saying, all for the most part, this episode, definitely um, join an organization fighting for justice. Um, if you feel like there's no respectable organization or, the, or let me say this an organization you don't deem respectable, um, right. Or that doesn't align with what you want to see in this world, then feel free to join to create your own, um, Grab you know, a couple of friends, folks. Exactly. Yeah. You don't need to be a millionaire. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I know we all, uh, annotated speaking of ideology and it was a bourgeois reactionary ideology. It tells you you need money to do everything. Um, yes, we need money for our organizations, but you don't need a money. You don't need millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to start an organization. Really, you can start this or- start an organization with zero dollars. Um, you know, and then obviously build from there. But uh, but yeah, so appreciate you guys joining the organization, fighting for justice. Um, hopefully, we catch you guys next week and forward ever. Forward ever.